Hi, I'm Dr. Lori. Welcome. Tonight, I'm going to talk with you about jewelry, shipping, the resellers, and how they can, of course, make sure storage and shipping goes well for you. I want to get started right now. I'm taking your questions. I got the expert answers for you. First things first, bubble wrap. You're all using bubble wrap. I want you to understand there's a wrong way and a right way to use bubble wrap. Oh my gosh, there's a wrong way and a right way. Yes, there is. There's a wrong way and a right way. My many, many years in museums, as well as my years as an appraiser, you learn how to actually wrap with bubble wrap. First things first, the actual bubbles go on the outside. The flat side touches the object, not the bubbles. Why? Because what you're trying to do with bubble wrap is you are trying to, in fact, prevent an external source from damaging your object. So bubble wrap has a right way and a wrong way. Make sure you use it correctly. Otherwise, it's not going to do you any good and it's expensive. So you want to make sure you're using it properly. So bigger bubbles, if you see these, bigger bubbles are going to usually be for larger objects. Sorry, here's in my face. <laughs> going to be for larger objects, right? Bigger bubbles, if there's an external force, something comes at your piece that's wrapped in bubble wrap, those bubbles are going to actually stop it. So if you get bubble wrap, okay? No, it's not bubbles in, Chris, no! <laughs> if you get some, some bubble wrap, you want to reuse it, don't pop the bubbles. I know the kids love to pop the bubbles. Don't pop the bubbles. Smaller bubbles for bubble wrap are for smaller, more delicate objects. And, and smaller bubble wrap, again, the flat side touches the object. Now it makes sense, that's right, when it touches the object and then you're going to wrap it. So if you were going to wrap, for example, this pin in bubble wrap, first you put it in tissue paper, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Tissue paper then did up bubble wrap for, again, pieces like this, which have, in this particular case, gold plating. So you have to do that. Yeah, thank God you were doing it right. So basically, then you put first tissue paper and then you go around and you wrap. And then again, you're gonna tape. So then what happens is it creates, again, a, in a pocket for you if something comes at it. Or if you're putting it together with multiple items, right, in the same box to save on shipping costs for your, for your client, then in fact, they, the pieces won't hit up against each other. The bubbles create cushions. I want you to think about that. The bubbles create cushion. So bubble wrap's how you do it. This is storage and, of course, shipping and storage tips. There's lots of tips, right, on, of course, my website. And I want you to go there. For example, you can sign up for the newsletter or you can use any, of course, of the information that's on the website for it. Bubble wrap is going to be important generally. You can subscribe to the newsletter and it's free. It's easy to do. It's at drlaurieV.com. I also want to talk to you tonight about what you're going to be looking for. Here are some, here's some of the shipping secrets. If, if it's for prints, if it's for jewelry, if it's for boxed items like ceramics and lamps and such, I want you to know how to actually do that. But I also want you to know what to look for. So a couple of things right out of the chute while we're talking about shipping. You probably are wondering, why does she have two big white pieces on either side of her? Well, I want you to understand some of the inexpensive ways that you can ship. I know, I'm happy to teach you all of this. I want you to succeed. I've been talking with all of you about video calls all day today and for the last couple of days, and I just want you to succeed. I want you to get it right off the bat. Thank you, Mary. And I want you to understand that there's really ways that you can do this and make money for yourselves doing it not to mention you're helping folks. Thank you for the super chats and super stickers, but I want you to understand how to do this inexpensively because it can get expensive. So a couple of different things. First of all, you probably recognize the garbage bag, right? I don't know, I buy them in bulk, but the garbage bag is gonna be really important and helpful. Now, I don't want you to overuse plastics. We wanna pro pro provide for everybody going forward. But basically, that's what you're looking at. This particular piece is a typical garbage bag. And if you look inside here, here is a piece, of course, of the tissue paper. And all the way in, if you keep moving, are actual prints. So the prints are actually protected in here. I don't know if you can see the print right there. A couple of different things I want you to know when you're making this, which are corner pockets with garbage bags. It was one of the typical things that museums would use and it was very easy and inexpensive. You make four corners. You make the triangles out of a heavy stock of paper. You make the four corners. You take a piece of foam core, acid-free foam core. You make the four corners, and you're basically going to tape them on with any kind of tape. I like, in this case, to use this sort of packaging tape. It's strong. Then what you do is you basically take the garbage bag, and you put the garbage bag into the pocket. 
Then the garbage bag, actually, and I'm gonna rip this one so you get a sense of what's happening underneath it. So then the garbage bag, in fact, is what you're gonna, you wouldn't rip it, you'd leave it alone. Inside the garbage bag, you're going to have wrapped, in fact, this new print paper, inexpensive, and all the way in, I'm gonna keep ripping, all the way in, you can see your work of art. No, you can't really see it. Let me make sure you see it. So you would see your work of art. Here comes this piece, and that's gonna be wrapped inside. So basically what you've created, is you've created a little pocket for yourself. And that pocket is going to protect the piece when you store it, and when you ship it too. So you could store it like this, leave it alone, it will be fine, or you can actually ship it like this. So what about peanuts in a flat bag with spray adhesive on the cardboard? You can do that, but the peanuts can move. And if you are actually trying to move, actually trying to ship a print, you don't wanna ship a print with peanuts because the peanuts can actually rub up against. You don't wanna do that, so be careful. Now, if you wanna use peanuts and you like peanuts and you're going to ship something like this, so this is what I want. Good morning from Australia, Elizabeth. I want you to realize that you have to put, if you have something that's hollow inside, right? You have to put something inside of it before you wrap it. That doesn't mean just bubble wrap. I want you to put peanuts inside of this or rolled up paper inside of something like this, like this cup, like the Dr. Lori Says mug, which, tech, which remember you can get right here on the channel and it supports the channel if you buy a mug. But basically right here, so you're going to, and I'm gonna tell you more, Elisa, about, of course, shipping art. If you have the peanuts or if you have rolled up paper, you put it inside this cup. Then you take, of course, a piece of tissue paper. You could use an expensive towel paper. You could use newsprint. Wrap it and then wrap another thing of bubble wrap or another part of paper. And you gotta wrap the heck out of it. You gotta wrap it if it's something like glass. But it's very important when you are wrapping and shipping ceramics, or glass or anything that has a hollow inside that you stuff the inside. Because if something were to, even with the bubble wrap, if something were to come this way, then what you're going to end, end up seeing is you're gonna see, of course, the glass crack. It has to have something on the other side to basically offset that external force. Yes, it would work great for record albums, anything flat. So advent calendars, record albums, prints, anything flat. And also you're leaving space all the way around the bubble wrap, all the way around the foam core. That's important too, to do that. I want you to understand how to do it. And it's simple. It's some tape, it's a garbage bag, it's some newsprint, and then the prints themselves, the works of art, the colorful works of art go inside. Now, then what you do, and I've shown you two examples here. So this is this, I'm gonna rip this off for here. Say you had this, you could take this, you'd shove it in here. <laughs> you take, in this particular case, it's small, so I'd use the smaller ones. And then you go around here. I used peanuts with my jewelry, they left dark spots on the sterling silver. I know, because you really don't wanna be using peanuts for things like jewelry. I want you to use tissue paper. If you have a piece like this, tissue paper, wrapped and rolled. I want you to roll it and then I want you to wrap it. So that's what you have to do. Getting, getting spots off sterling silver, now you're gonna have to clean the sterling silver. So remember, you've gotta be careful before you decide how to ship and how to wrap. And if that happens and you send that off to a client and the spots are on it, then you've got a problem with the client. So we're trying to avoid that. So these pieces have to be have to have something in it. You can get in line to ask a question, Carol, ask away. So I'm taking your questions, yes. Having said that, this piece is another example and it's a different example. So you have this particular piece and this piece is a much more valuable and fragile print. Now, all prints are gonna be important. This works fine for most prints and you could put multiple prints into the garbage bag and do this this way. But for a piece that's more valuable, you know, you decided that you're going to actually ship a smaller print, a print by a major artist, a print that's more expensive, a print that's older and more fragile, then this is what you're looking at here. This particular piece has, again, only one print in it, and you'll notice that the whole envelope is made. We kind of made a makeshift envelope over here, but we're trying to add more pieces on it in this particular case. Then what you can do is you can actually take another piece of foam core, right, place it right on top with nothing on it, and then, do the tape all the way around, wrap it in the wrapping paper, 
put fragile on it, send it off to whoever, however you do it, shipping, whoever's doing your shipping. Hi, Leah. What about wrapping with cloth? You can wrap with cloth if you want to wrap with cloth, but for certain items, I want you to protect the item and I want to see if we can do this low cost for you. I'm using examples from my nearly 25, 30 years in museums as an appraiser, as an art historian to teach you these things. I want you to know the real expertise, not what somebody does and has had luck with, but what museums do regularly because they're shipping art, antiques, collectibles, memorabilia, pieces that are very important for historic and monetary value. They're doing this all the time and they do it the right way. So if you know the right way, we can figure out ways to make it a little bit more inexpensive for you. Okay, so this piece could actually go over here on this piece. We tape up the whole thing and ship it. All right, so that's one of the ways you can do it. Some people will also like to, in fact, take these pieces and they'll like to say, okay, I'm going to put some plastic over it just in case there's inclement weather when it's, when it's being shipped, right? Put some of this over it and go from there. There's foam core at, at Dollar Tree. Would that work? Foam core at Dollar Tree will work as long as it is foam core. You have to check and make sure that these elements you're using are acid free if you're going to frame with them. So if you're using foam core from Dollar Tree or wherever inexpensive place, if you're going to use that, make sure it's acid free if you're going to use it for, again, framing. If you're going to use foam core for this these purposes, it doesn't have to be 100% acid free, but most foam core is acid free. Okay, so you saw this. And then the other thing that I wanted to teach you about today, because some of you are asking me about, of course, how to actually move art or how to, in fact, ship art. Here's a painting for you. So paintings, of course, are very fragile. Most people will build a crate. You know what it costs to build a crate? You know how many museum exhibitions I did with paintings where you have to pay the guy to build the crate for the painting? Big, use wooden crate, protect the frame, put on all of the, the foam core, the bubble wrap, the whole thing. It's a whole issue to do that. So, in fact, what you have to do here with paintings is you have to somehow protect in the front. The best way to protect the front also is, of course, the bubble wrap. I'm sorry, not the bubble wrap, is the foam core. So the foam core goes over it. You can actually, using blue painter's tape, attach the foam core board. I'll use this one. So the foam core board here, right? You take a little bit of the tape, and then you're going to attach the tape to the back of the frame. And that's going to make sure it's cut to size. This one is not because I'm not cutting for you tonight. But basically, make sure it's cut to size of how big the outside edges of the frame is on your painting. So now what happens is there's a little air pocket right inside of the work of art. I even prefer to put glycine paper or any kind of tissue paper underneath before you put the foam core on. And then you can basically wrap it as well. Then you've made your own crate and you haven't paid for lumber costs. You know what lumber's costing? Expensive. So I want you to think about that. There's lots of these tips about, of course, reselling art and how to value it as well, uh, as I said, on my website. There's all kinds of important information on the website. All you have to do is go to the research, se the research section at drlaurieve.com and you'll learn all kinds of information that will help you to succeed in your own reselling business or to help you when you wanna get a new piece of art for your home. So that's one of the ways with respect to prints, framing them and shipping them, and also paintings. Now, does it have to be acid-free paper if you're shipping art and clothing? Well, acid-free paper is best, right? It's best if you have acid-free paper, it's best if you're doing that, it will protect it. However, acid-free paper is utilized mainly for storage. If you're gonna keep your Rembrandt prints in storage for a long time with the Solander boxes that I recommend on my specials and shop page, with those particular types of storage and display specials that I recommend those products, then acid-free paper is great, but you wanna make sure that you're not spending a lot on acid-free paper, because it can be expensive, right? For something that you're just gonna ship off to a client. If you're gonna store it for yourself, you wanna protect your own collection, you need acid-free paper and you need a solander box, okay? If you're going to frame a piece, like a print, then you want to think about, of course, acid-free paper, acid-free foam core, acid-free mat board. 
And it is important because without acid-free foam core and acid-free mat board, what you have is a damaged acid print. And once it's damaged, it's literally several hundreds to thousands of dollars in paper conservation to get it back to looking bright and white. I had a priority client recently who showed me all of these pieces that she got in an estate sale. They're beautiful pieces, significantly acid burned. I had to tell her it's not really worth the cost of the, of the paper conservation to get that reversed. Can you put aluminum foil as a temporary moisture barrier? I would not use aluminum foil as a temporary moisture barrier. Also, aluminum foil is very expensive. It's also heavy. So if you are shipping by weight, it's going to put up a little bit more weight and you don't want to pay for the extra weight and neither do your clients. So I wouldn't use tin foil as an extra moisture barrier. Museums don't use it. Next. Well, I just sort of paid, really needed this information. Thanks, Dr. Laura. You're welcome. That's what I give you. I give you information you can use. I'm not just standing there trying to sell you something. Shah, I want you to understand and learn it because everyone, all those other people are trying to sell you something the same way you're trying to sell things to other people. I want you to have the information that will help you to succeed. Thank you, Donna, for the super chats and the super stickers. I want to remind you and thank you all for supporting the channel with shares and also with super chats and super stickers. Every time you do a super chat and super sticker, you help me get closer to making another video that's informative, helpful for you. So thank you. I want to talk a little bit about if you are, we know what happens if you're going to ship a print. Remember, you want to protect the frame. So you may want to build corners around the frame as well and then put something over it and then put that piece of foam core on this side, right? You want to protect the frames. The frames are worth money. Well, scented bags damage the art. Scented bags could leave an odor. So if you have a canvas, for example, I was talking to a woman today in Texas and she said, I went up to the painting and it kind of had a, a faint smell to it. I don't know what the smell is. Sometimes that could be things like, of course, smoke from smoking, but it also could be from something that happened in shipping. So scented bags, be careful of those because that scent could off gas and canvas is canvas. It's going to, it's going to up like a sponge. It's going to take up like a sponge, whatever smell is around it. So, you know, you could get that to your client and the, your buyer and your buyer says, I don't like this smell. You know, like me, I hate smells. I don't like smells at all. I wear very, very light perfume. I'm not big on smells. So a lot of people may not like the odor, even if it's a nice odor to you. I'm not big on this. Less is more with this. And that's been a mantra of museum professionals for years and years and years. Can you ship the framed work with just the foam pour? Wait a minute, I'm getting to it, Alyssa. So here's the other piece. A lot of you will have pieces with glass. This is one of the hardest things to do, and there's such an easy fix. You're all going to say, why was I going crazy about glass? Here's how you do it. Basically, what you do, you saw the foam, you saw the, the bubble wrap. You're going to need some bubble wrap. But the first thing you're going to need is blue painter's tape. So you have a print like this one. Well, this happens to be a watercolor. You have a watercolor like this one or a print, and it is in, let me move come a couple of things, sorry. I'm going to move a couple of things. Go easy. All right. <laughs> so a couple of things here. This particular piece is a matted and framed, matted and framed piece. Can we take that? Yeah, thank you. So a matted and framed piece here. Can you see the mat board here? And then the piece itself, and then the frame down here where my finger is. Okay. So you're looking at this. And what I want to show you is there's a piece of glass on this whole piece. Well, you want to sell this and you want to send it to your buyer with that piece of glass on it. Now you're thinking, well, what happens if the glass breaks in transit? Well, this is how museum professionals have for years prevented that. Blue painter's tape is the clue. You make a crisscross pattern. I didn't do the whole thing, but you put the crisscross. Alyssa, I'm getting to it, darling. Give me a chance. <laughs> so basically what you do here is you take the... You take the blue painter's tape and you go and you make this nice crisscross pattern here, like a rose trellis, like a wine rack. I love wine, like a wine rack. And you go this way. I know you're all laughing at me. She loves wine. I love Dr. Lori. I love all of you too. I want you to do well. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> take the blue tape, put it this way, all the way down through the whole piece. It's a lot of blue tape. Why do you do that? Then you're going to put the, the foam core if you can then you're going to put the bubble wrap on top. 
Okay. Then you're going to wrap it usually in brown paper and you put fragile on it and off it goes. Here's why. If even after all of this prep that you've done in shipping, there is still something that cracks that glass, that glass won't damage that watercolor. It won't poke through and actually hit the work of art, the paper. It won't have little shards of glass because where do the little shards of glass end up? Stuck to the tape. So if it breaks, if the glass breaks, it's stuck to its little square of tape and that's what you want. Now you have to go through and you have to do the whole thing. As I said, I only did partial, but it's a really good tip and it's one that's used in major museums all across the world, really all around the world for many, many years. So understand what you've got with that. Reminding you how much you appreciate, Dr. Laura, you're looking fabulous. I set alarms for your videos. Well, Kimberly, thank you very much. I'm so glad that you're enjoying all of this. I can't say I feel fabulous all the time, but I'm always happy when I'm able to share my expertise with you. And I'm really happy when I hear that you're succeeding. I want to hear those stories. And I want to hear when you're having obstacles because I can probably help you get through those too. So just let me know. Keep in touch with me. I want to know. How about photographs? Do you store them the same way? Photographs have to be in what are called photo sleeves and they are black. They're black in color to keep them out of the dark, okay? So photo sleeves are typically that. One of my upcoming videos, I'll show you a photo sleeve. I didn't think of it for tonight. So thanks for that, Vince. I appreciate that idea, but yes. So the other thing about photos is you can put them in solid or boxes if you are not store, if you are not framing them. So that's great. Couple of other things I wanna remind you. You can always, I can always answer any of these questions, of course, and consult with you on my video calls. And now we've added this, which I think a lot of you are gonna like, or at least you should spread the word about them. Gift certificates for video calls. That's right, you can do a video call with me and the gift certificate. So get somebody to buy you a video call. There's lots of holidays always coming up. Look down the calendar, there's always a holiday on the horizon. So you can of course get that. Or maybe you have a couple birthdays a year. Maybe, you know, one at your real birthday and one at your six month birthday. I don't know. But anyway, so gift certificates are available too. Video calls look like this where you can, with your favorite video conferencing app, you can talk to me. I'm in the corner of the video call and you're walking me through the house or maybe you're taking me shopping with you. But the gift certificates are really gonna be fun because now you can get gifts of Dr. Lori, which is fun. More about more back mortise shipping and storage. This is one of the techniques that really will help you a lot and it's inexpensive. So if you're downsizing, say you're not a reseller, say you're just downsizing. Thank you very much, Robin. I'm glad I looked forward to it all day too. So um, maybe you're downsizing. Maybe you know you're helping to clean out mom or grandmom's or aunt Susie's house, you know, that kind of thing. So I want you to think about these techniques because these techniques will help you. I also want you to remember that there's lots of techniques for other for other things, for different types of things. If you're storing, if you're going to ship large pieces that are fragile in one box, because you don't want to do multiple boxes, right? I want you to make sure you use enough packaging material. You're gonna have to invest in packaging material. What about using paper bags instead of plastic? Angela, you certainly can do that. Yes, that's fine. The reason why a plastic bag was used in this particular case was because this particular piece that I showed you. This one had this piece, sorry guys. <laughs> this piece had this piece right up against the other one so they didn't want to put two papers. So this is the same as a paper bag. Same type of thing, you could do that. Yes, you could use a paper bag if you prefer. I prefer, I have a very, very close friend who helps to save whales all over the world. Um, and he is a lovely person who I've been in many parts of the world with um, watching the sea creatures. And in fact, he always says, if you can use fewer plastic bags, do. I wanted to show you an example, but yes, if you wanna use paper bags, you may. Make sure you put a note to whomever you're shipping it to, whether it's friends, family, or of course a buyer, that they should remove the, the paper bag. Paper bags that are brown paper bags are acidic, so you don't wanna have them just leave it in that paper bag for a long time. So that's the other thing. But a couple of tips about how do you actually use bubble wrap and how do you actually of course, wrap to help you. All right, now, I wanna also talk to you about one of my favorite things. I bought a print for $20, sold it for $125, all because of your urging us to get art. Did I tell you? I told you. <laughs> you know, you can buy the, the piece that's, you know, 20 bucks and then resell it for a couple hundred. You can buy the artwork and you can make a very, very good, you can make a very, very good return on investment. If it's not framed, is there anything wrong with rolling and shipping in a tube? Well, yeah, there kind of is. 
because on the other end, what has to happen is you got something rolled. It came in a tube. Now you've got to unroll it. Now it looks like this, right? It's rolled. Now you have to take four bricks. You have to wrap them in white cotton towels or white cotton textile. You have to put, you have to flay it out on a flat table where your kids aren't, where your grandkids aren't, where your pets aren't, where your husband isn't, where your wife isn't, you know, where the people who get in your way are not, right? You have to lay it out on, on, a, on a table. You have to put the four bricks on the four corners of the piece. Now you have to get it to lie flat. Why? Oh, well, I'll just take it to the framers because I bought it and I love it. And I want it framed anyway. And they can dry mount it. The minute they dry mount it, value goes from here to here. So you can't just solve it with dry mounting. Oh, no, Dr. Lori. Oh, no, that's how it is. So I'm not big on put it in a tube. I know you all like to do that, but then you've got to think about the person on the other end. The person on the other end doesn't care. Well, that's between you and them. The other thing is remember and make sure that those tubes are that have an insulation too. I always say, even if you're going to put something in a tube, wrap it in some white paper anyway, because if that tube gets wet, like soaking wet in rain, then you're going to have a problem. This is gold. Oh, I missed it. I have a lot of artwork for sell sale and was freaking out over getting it delivered in one piece. Danielle, I am right here. What you have to do for me, share this channel, keep watching, tell people. I want you to be helped. That helped you and that's going to help you sell that stuff because now you're not worried about it. I'm so happy that this is helping you. I knew it would. If you're downsizing, as I said, and you have many pieces, I want you to remember some basic ideas. I want you, if you are stacking pieces, put something like foam core or a piece of board in between it if you're downsizing. If you're getting ready for a move, I want pieces, of course, back to back and face to face. This is back to back and face to face. I love you, Dr. Laura. I love you too. I know you're taking grief, but your history and your character are exemplary. I do take a lot of grief when I don't prefer and I don't really like it because I think it slows down all the information I'm trying to get out. I don't like the nonsense because it hurts you. Yeah, yeah, sure, you hurt my feelings. Okay, fine, hurt my feelings. I don't care about trolls. Here's my deal. I want to get this information out to you. There's a lot up here that can help you. I know it. And I'm trying to get it out to you. That's why I need you to use that binge link. I need you to watch those videos because there's so much information. It is jam-packed. These people who want to who want to say bad things about me, go ahead. Because you know what they know? They are watching me. They're watching me because they want to take this information that I'm trying to get out to you. You'll all help me. I know you will. Anyway, other things I want you to remember, we're going to get to the Dr. Lori Cam. Painter's tape only, correct? So there is no residue left. Grandma sews brown. Yeah, yeah. No residue, right? Because when this comes off, there's no residue, and that's important. So yeah, painter's tape. The thick painter's tape you could use too. You know, there's one that's really thick. Um, I oftentimes just make more of the squares. I always did it that way from years back when I was at the Yale Art Gallery. So a little late to the party. Love you so much, Dr. Lori. Vancouver Island, Canada. Yeah, beautiful place. Really beautiful. And beautiful people. A lot of Canadians and a lot of British Columbians who really have a lot of fun. They were saying, I was on a video call with someone from uh, BC and they said, Dr. Lori, you know, everybody's in the art aisle saying, you think Dr. Lori would like this? You think Dr. Lori would like that? At the thrift store. So I think that's great. I want you to look. I want you to get it because there's lots of money in it. There's also lots of money in jewelry. Let's take a, ta a little look at some jewelry here. So we're going to get out the Dr. Lori cam. I hope you got your loop. Oh, what is dry mounting? Dry mounting is usually used by professional framers to make a piece flat and they actually mount it. Um, they will dry mount it using a machine. It kind of looks like the machine that the dryer, that the people at the dry cleaners will use to press your, your, uh, your shirts. Looks like the same kind of machine. What is foam core, sweetie? This is foam core. Foam core has a core that is foam. That's foam core. So this piece right here is foam core. If you go to Michael's, Hobby Lobby, I don't know, any of those places, um, the arts and crafts store, they always have it. I'm sure Walmart also has it. Um, so foam core is not difficult to find. You can use mat board, but mat board is more expensive than foam core. So you want to think about that. Um, uh, video call on Monday, what should we start with? I don't care what you start with. doesn't matter to me. Start with the thing that you want to know most about, right? All right, let's take a look at this piece of jewelry. Thank you very much, Suzanne Marie. I'm happy that I'm helping you. All of those super chats and super stickers help me help you because it all goes to support, of course, my great professional staff as well as me making more videos. Rachel, I have a priority subscription. You'll love it. Rachel, I loved helping you 
to, of course, go through the objects from your family and, of course, your treasures that you bought over the years. I'm glad you've enjoyed the priority subscription. Many of my priority members, I make them a priority. The priority Ask Dr. Lori service, I have to say, it's a winner, and I'm glad it's helping all of you. So sign up when you can. Um, I missed one there. I'm sorry. I missed a. Um, I missed one. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll come back to that question at some point. So a couple of things. First of all, we were talking about jewelry, and there are a lot of new videos coming, of course, about jewelry. I know you've been asking for them, and I've delivered. So look for those. Use that binge link. This piece is a good example of, of about value in these pieces. First of all, you look at this piece, and I'm just going to pick another piece. I'm going to pick this piece, right? So you look at them and you say, okay, so two pieces of jewelry. Don't know if they're costume. Don't know if they are actually fine jewelry. Let's talk a little bit about fine jewelry. Have you looked at fine jewelry? You know, jewelry that's marked 14K, 18K, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold online lately. Well, you know what? The prices are very high, even for estate pieces, pieces that have been worn and used in fine jewelry. Well, as those numbers go up, guess what happens to costume jewelry? Costume jewelry has to go up as well. So those of you who are thinking, oh, costume jewelry is never very valuable, the fine jewelry market has helped the costume jewelry market increase in value. You can still get good deals where, oh, lots of places, online auctions, the boxes, right? The blue boxes that you're going to see at places like Goodwill, the jewelry jars that a lot of people buy. People are making a lot of money. Many, many, many of my clients are getting in touch with me saying, Dr. Lori, I bought 40 pounds of jewelry. I bought 30 pounds of this. I bought 12 pounds for this much. It's really a good idea. Thank you very much for your super sticker. I appreciate all of them. So maybe you're there and you're seeing these. You love the newsletter? Jewelry is the bomb in our home and your expertise blows it out of the water. I'm so glad I'm trying to help all of you. As opposed to just telling you, oh, I love this, oh, I love that. I want you to know why you should love it. You don't have to love what I love. You don't have to like or have the same taste that I have. You just have to know how to recognize quality. That's what I want you to do. And once you know how to do that, no one's gonna beat you. There, you're gonna be able to find the pieces you love and keep those or resell them for top dollar. I'm gonna show you how. I'm going to do it right here on the channel, and I'm going to show you about shipping and storage with those products that I recommend. There's a reason I recommend those on DrLoriV.com on my shopping and specials page. That's the reason I do that. So when you go to the shop and specials page, there's a reason at the bottom where the loop is. You all got the loop. I had someone today call it the Dr. Lori loop. <laughs> I really think it's a money magnet. You're going to find money with it. It's a really wonderful thing. It's very easy to find. If you go to, of course, the top of drlorivee.com, the specials and shop page, it's right there in red. Click on that, scroll down where it says go shopping now. I want you to click and go shopping. Go shopping, find those pieces that you need. The loop, inexpensive and you need it. And you need probably one or two. So I've watched different YouTubers talk about thrifting. They never talk about successes. It makes me wonder if they are successful or know what's actually worth something. You're the real deal. Well, I am the real deal. That's right. And I worked a long time to become the real deal. And these people who, you know, oh, it's this and oh, it's that. Here's the problem with, and I don't want to badmouth anybody. Everybody else, hey, have your channel. Good luck to you. But the problem is that if they're not talking about success, when you go to investigate, well, how much did they sell? And if they're trying to sell to you, you're trying to sell to other people. This doesn't help you resell. What helps you resell is know when you spotted something valuable and to know what the true value is. I tell you both those things in every video, not just a couple of videos. Oh, I love this. Oh, I love that. That's great. We all know what we like. You don't need people to tell you that. You need people to tell you what you got. Okay, let's get back to that. So I picked up these two, right? One is fine jewelry. One is costume jewelry. Guess what? They're worth about the same. Oh, wait a minute. The magnet just got involved. Well, he, you know what? The magnet actually is going to help me because it makes me remember something. This particular bracelet is a cool little bracelet. It's pretty, you know, I'll show it to you on the Dr. Lori Cam. Pretty bracelet. Oh, I don't know. Where am I here? So here it is. Whoa, oh, did I do something? Was that me? So here's the bracelet. It's a nice bracelet. <laughs> it's a nice bracelet. It's beaded. Oh, I'm sorry. This is totally my fault. Hang with me, guys. 
So we've got the bracelet. No, yes. There it is. So you can see that beaded bracelet. At the end of that beaded bracelet is a magnet. In the end is a magnet. See how it goes together? The next time you are going out thrifting, I want you to put on a bracelet that has a magnet. If you don't have a bracelet with a magnet, go buy yourself a bracelet with a magnet. And here's why. Let me put these down. I'm talking with my hands. Here's why. You put this on, the magnet snaps, it stays on your wrist easy, right? Get on my fat wrist. <laughs> okay, there you go. So it's on your wrist. Guess what? You are in the store and you want to know whether or not you have a piece that is not real gold, guess what the magnet does? The magnet psh, will show you the pieces that are not real gold, right? So this is why having a bracelet that's a magnet on is really gonna help you. You're not gonna have to worry about it. You can use the loop to learn the marks on a piece that of course won't stick to the magnet, right? This one won't stick to the magnet. Why? Because this one is a base metal, right? Not gold, and this one, is not gold, but it's not sterling silver. This particular piece is sterling silver. How are we gonna know that? Right here, because it's marked. So let me get to that and show you that mark with the loop. Now, all of you should be out there, and I'm gonna ask you, and I hope you know the answer, what should the mark say on this piece? What should the mark say? I don't see it in the comments. Well, I'm trying to get it. The mark should say 925. I'm having a hard time getting there. It is. Do you see 925 there? That's what the mark should say for sterling silver. Now, you're looking at this going, Dr. Lori, that looks gold to me. I'm going to put down the camera now. Yes, it looks gold to you because it's sterling silver with gold overlay. Now, having said that, this particular piece that's sterling silver over with gold overlay, gold will take better to a piece of sterling silver than it will to this inexpensive metal. That's why the gold in this doesn't look so great. I'm gonna put them side by side and show you so you can see how much shinier the actual piece is one to the other. Do you see it? This one with the links here is much shinier and much more gold, the overlay, than the other. And that's, oh, there it is. There's the shot. And that's what I want you to see. The one with all of the flowers is not, of course, is an inexpensive piece with respect to, I'm going to put the camera down now, with respect to costume jewelry. But again, a nice piece to wear, it's not hurting anybody, but it certainly isn't what the Italian made sterling silver with gold overlay piece is. So understanding what you've got is gonna be important. And how are you gonna know? The loop, 925, here they go. I know you know. I know you know because I know you know or you learned it or you learned it here or you've been looking. And I want you to use this information so you can keep looking. The magnetic bracelet is gonna help you too. And that was just, that was serendipity. That was helpful that that bracelet was sitting there with the magnets and the beads. So don't forget that you can use this information to your best benefit. Now, there was a question. I'm sorry I'm missing them. I'm talking so much, going so fast that I'm missing them. When you're storing, hi, Dr. Lori, talk about our, our video call a few months back. Talk about 14 KP, my emerald ring and pave diamonds for 9.99. The KP info was great. Okay. There's a couple of different things. Thank you, Chris. Um, there are different marks when you see 14K. So 14K means 14 carat. It could say GF after the 14K mark, which would mean, of course, gold filled. It could say P for plated, which means, again, it's plated over the way something's electroplated, right? It could be gold plated as well as silver plated, um, those types of things. So Chris was got a big benefit out of a video call with me because I was able to explain this to her. So this is not difficult. It's just that you need to know. And people out there don't want you to know. A lot of people don't want you to know. They don't want you to know. Well, I started this whole thing, this whole appraisal, um, this whole appraisal tour and all of this because I met a woman who an appraiser didn't want her to know that she had a she had a fifty thousand dollar document. So he offered her fifty bucks. 
And he went off and he got his $50,000 for her document. A lot of people don't want you to know. I want you to know. I want you to succeed. I want women empowered. It's not difficult to do. Share the information. Love you, Dr. Lori. Thank you for my video appraisal today, Mary. Oh, Mary, it was nice to talk with you today. Mary had beautiful blue glasses. I saw her at, wow, that's great. And she said what I oftentimes say, oh, I got a three pack at one of the big box stores. <laughs> but they looked pretty on it. Anyway, we've, I've had a lot of fun talking about all different types of things. And I've had a lot of fun educating families because the video calls are a great opportunity where you can have multiple members of your family who are all over the world, you know, talk at the same time and learn about what family heirlooms are worth. If I buy a piece of art of Howard Hardy and frame it, says it from, it's from a gallery in North Carolina, is it value? If not, a painting but looks like a print. Okay, let me make sure I got this right, Texas Rose or TX Rose. Um, if I buy a piece of art, oh, I'm sorry, it left. <laughs> okay. If I buy a piece of art, okay, by somebody, and you frame it, it says it's from a gallery in North Carolina, is it valuable? Okay, just because it's from a gallery doesn't mean it's valuable. It could be valuable, but a lot of people will call themselves galleries whether or not they are, right? Especially today with the internet world. You know, you don't have that, oh, I got this from this prestigious gallery, or I got this from this other prestigious gallery. So be careful of that. Um, if you reframe it, is it valuable? Anytime you enhance, right? A work of art, usually that's with a frame, right? You can impact its value. If you do a good job and the frame is of high quality and it's framed well, then you can increase the value. If you do a bad job, you'll decrease the value. That's the same with restoration. If you restore something, you do a good job, you could increase the value. You do a bad job, you could decrease the value. But again, it's never a bad idea. Now, whether or not you have a painting versus a print, is a very, very big difference. And I talk about this at my on my website. You can sign up also to and read my blog. You know, you could subscribe to the newsletter where there's information, but that's about valuing items. So for example, you could have a Picasso print that's worth, you know, some prints go for a hundred and fifty, you know, there was a Toulouse-Lautrec print that went for almost a million dollars. So, you know, you could get a print that's really valuable, but it's a print. So I won't stand here and say prints are always less valuable than paintings, right? Because that particular Toulouse-Lautrec print is worth a lot more than this painting. So you can't say every painting is worth more than every print. But in fact, you want to make sure you know what you're getting. So if they're, not, if they're not sure, if they're saying, well, it's an original work of art, that kind of thing. My wife's idea, thank you, Dr. Lori, for all you do. You're the greatest. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I remember um, her from a video call, which was a lot of fun. And she said, well, my husband was going to do this whole online selling thing. He said, because I had the idea and then I ended up doing it. But it seems like you're having a lot of fun doing it. And all of you are having a lot of fun. And I'm glad that you're having fun here and you're learning. So I want you tonight to do me a favor. I want you to find five people that you can share the channel with. Five. That's what I'm going to ask you to do for me tonight. And thank you for the super chats and the super stickers. There was a question there I missed. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll tell you, I got saints who are helping me. My, my staff, bunch of saints. <laughs> Just purchased Royal Bay Ruth turtle creamer. That's nice. And turtle milk pitcher. That's nice too. And cat creamer, tabby. I heard the turtle creamer is the rarest of them all. Well, I'm the fairest of them all. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You made me think of it. The rarest of them all. Is that true? Okay. In certain markets, you will see higher values, right, for that creamer. But here's the issue. Rarity doesn't automatically connect to value. I know you all care about rarity. It's not the rarest that are always the most valuable. They have to be with, they have to be a knowledge base of that object. So if it was really, really, truly rare, 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 and nobody saw it, it wouldn't be as valuable. So rarity is great, but rarity will only re relate to value. Okay, so you can't equate it to it's always going to be more expensive. And the other thing I want you to remember, if you have that group, you can increase the value of all of the pieces if you group them with the one that's so rare and everybody's looking for, right? So those other pieces, if you just keep them by the wayside and you only resell the rarest one, you're not going to be able to command enough and you're not using the quality and the rarity value of that particular piece to bring up and lift up the value of the other two. I want you to learn the tricks that are used in, by professional art dealers, by professional antique dealers, and by museum professionals for years, decades even. I want you to realize how this actually works. Once you understand how the markets work, which I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach it to you here, 
I'm going to teach it to you at drlorev.com. Then you're going to be able to command more. Other people who are just showing you what they sold and said, oh, I sold this on eBay. Oh, I sold this on Etsy. That's great. But they're not going to teach you how to do it and how to succeed and actually how to, in competition, get buyers to look at your objects rather than theirs. So I'm here to help you. But that was a very good question. A lot of good questions tonight. I'm so happy to be here to be able to give you my expert answers to your questions. I hope you learned a little bit tonight about downsizing shipping storage, a little bit about values of, of course, glass and jewelry, and of course, uh, artwork. And the artwork, of course, is one of the great things that we're going to look at. I'll see you next time. I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. Thanks for being with me.